appreciate that. That's kind of you. Now, first, I want to let everybody real clear. You may, uh, partway through my speech, lunch might kick in, you fade off just a little bit. But while I have your attention, I want you all to note about the beautiful weather outside. Is there a nicer day than today? Hardly ever. So that tells you that Texas is shining bright. Our bond rating is excellent and it will continue into the future. And now it's great to be with you today and I'm gonna leave. <laughs> now uh, I will have to make one other comment before I, I get into the speech that I was gonna mention to you today. When I, every time I hear somebody say the honorable, it harkens back several years ago, those of you who may not know, I served in the Texas House for four years, then I served in the Senate for almost eight years, and then now in my current capacity as controller of public accounts. And if you go back 12 years and a couple of weeks when the legislature started their first session, the first issue before me as almost a newly sworn in state representative was my first dilemma. And that dilemma was my wife had worked very hard to help me on the campaign. So she has to be there next to me as I get sworn into office. But the problem I had is I also needed my grandparents there. And my grandparents, what my grandmother at the time, she was not going to live much past session. And so it was really important that they would be there for my first swearing in. And you have your chair plus two chairs. So what do you do? So came up with the great idea that my wife and I squeezed into our chair. Fortunately, she's a small petite lady, so she's up in the front left corner. I'm in the back corner. I stood up, I took the oath of office. I sat back down, and I don't know, men, if you ever have a really dumb moment in your marriage, maybe you've never had one. I had one as my first act as a state representative. I leaned up into my wife's right ear, right here, and she's a uh, very strong lady beautiful ladies, someone that I could search the world over and over and never find a more perfect person to live with and be married to. But when I uttered the words into her right ear that you can call now call me honorable, <laughs> well, let me just tell you, she didn't laugh like you. The look on my wife's face is one that I have hoped to never repeat ever again in my marriage. When I stood up and took the oath of office four years later into the Texas Senate, we had our first daughter at the time, so she was holding our daughter. I took the oath of office, and you know what I did? I sat down and I kept my mouth shut. <laughs> when I got sworn in as Texas Controller of Public Accounts earlier this year, I took the oath of office and I sat down and I kept my mouth shut. So every time somebody says honorable, you make me think back to that face of my wife that I just don't want to repeat there again. But it's great to be with you. I'd like to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about the overview of the revenue estimate that I provided several weeks ago to the Texas legislature. The first act that I have is controller of public accounts within just a few, a few short days is to talk about the amount of revenue that is going to come into the state treasury starting in September of this year and running for the next two years. If you look at the state treasury here in Texas, we start with a surplus of $7.5 billion that is left over from the current biennium that is going to end in August. So therefore, over the course of the last two years, the Treasury has done well. We have benefited significantly the economy here in Texas, and we have a $7.5 billion roughly estimated excess from this current biennium. Then you have to add into that, if you look at our state budget, you break it up pretty much into two different parts, at least for me giving the biennial revenue estimate. One part is our federal dollars, general revenue dollars that are dedicated for specific purposes, and then certain other income as we classify it. And those dollars is kind of not part of my biennial revenue estimate because we go over to the portion that is general related dollars that is not dedicated, and those are the ones that the legislature specifically has some discretion over. And if you talk about the dollars that are coming in for the next two years, we forecast that that's $110.4 billion. So you add the 7.5 excess to the 110.4 that is projected to come in in the Treasury over the course of the next two years, and then you have to subtract out $5 billion because a portion of those dollars are dedicated to go into what's called our rainy day fund or our savings account, and then last November as a constitutional amendment by the voters here in Texas that half of those dollars go into what's called our highway fund. So you subtract that number out and the legislature has 
roughly $113 billion to talk about this session. Now, to put that in perspective, you also have to add on top of that the federal dollars, the GR dedicated dollars, as well as the small sum of other dollars, and that's another $110.5 billion. Those two combined are the potential for the upcoming budget. Now, the legislature also has a cap on how much they can spend up to. We don't, we don't set that limit. That's something that our legislative budget board sets those numbers, and so therefore, that's the confines upon which the, the legislature lives in in this upcoming budget. Let me talk a little bit about the economy here in Texas as we see it in the controller's office. Somebody had asked me last week as I was walking the halls of the Capitol, I had several people ask me almost the identical question. And they said, Glenn, I got a quick question for you. As you're looking at prices of the economy, you're looking at the different industry segments, we have 26 million people, and they, this isn't the part they added, this is me adding on top of it. 26 million people that live in the state of Texas, a very diverse economy, but one that, as if no one had noticed, all prices had plummeted since October, November of last year. So the question is that several people have asked almost identically is, have you been losing sleep over that? And easily I said that in November, December of last year, I lost quite a bit of sleep over it. There was even a time when my wife and I, there was one promise during the campaign that no matter what, that was to my wife, that her and I would get out of town. And so we were out of town by the third morning. She knew that I woke up early. She knows I wake up early in the morning. That's growing up on the family farm. I wake up early. I was reading articles. Uh, Tom Cure, my revenue estimator, even though we were quite far out of town, I was emailing back and forth with him early in the morning. Have you seen this article, this article, this literature that I found? And by the third morning, my wife looked at me and she said, so what is oil prices doing today? She knew that back then, we we're very keen on the oil prices. Texas has been very, very blessed since the last recession with the shale boom to have benefited. And part of the 7.5 excess is a large tribute to oil prices in this economy. But with that being said, when I gave the revenue estimate in speech and speech over, I have highlighted that the 1.2 million jobs that have been added in Texas since the last recession yes have been a stimulus in part because of the shell boom but then you also have to take into account that since i was sworn into office on the second of january in just a month texas has added another fifteen thousand jobs in other sectors we're not the texas of the 1980s and so therefore we project that texas is going to continue to grow as an economy but it will be more moderated than what we have seen over the course of the last couple of years. One notation, I had a lot of input about this number as soon as I gave the revenue estimate, is that in the revenue estimate, we talk about how oil prices will be average of $65 through the rest of this biennium, and roughly about $65 is the target price we put on it starting in September for the following year. And a lot of people said, well, Glenn, don't you know oil's not $65? Thank you for telling me, I appreciate that. You have to take into account with our state treasury that we've had five months of average oil prices that are $80. And so therefore, if you look at the remaining seven months of this current fiscal year we're in, we roughly need a little over $52 oil to average that out. And what my goal has been is to take the information and the data that we have in our revenue estimating team, to take the information and data that we gather from all of our services, our communications in wide variety of industry sectors, not just in Texas, but outside of Texas, is to get to the most accurate information that we can provide to the legislature and to the public. And so with that accurate, that information, on that day as well as today a month later, I still feel very confident the Texas is going to continue to grow. And that's why I point out today is a bright day. And I think Texas economy is going to continue to be bright, but a little bit more moderated. I'll switch real quick to my vision for the state agency. As you heard earlier, 
This state agency of roughly 3,000 employees is one of the few and probably the only one that touches every single life in this entire state. We touch everybody. Why? Because we're the accountant, we're the treasury for the state of Texas, we're the revenue estimator, we're the tax collector. Have any of you in this room ever run for office? If you had, it's a hard job. But if you have, try to be the tax collector and run for public office. A lot of my predecessors don't want to talk about the fact that we're the tax collector. But here just the other day, I was reading an article about the IRS is cutting back on number of employees to deal with us, the taxpayers. And to me, that's the absolute last thing that we need to do. When I sat before our committee on Senate Finance last week, and as I will next week in House Appropriations, to talk about the priorities in the agency, and of 20 plus divisions in this agency that deal with a whole host of different things that we are in charge of, half of the agency is in tax administration. And so that means when it comes to policy that we are to create, the legislature gives guidance, maybe technology changes, business practices change, we have to make sure that policy is very clear so when our audit team goes out, we don't have inconsistencies across the 277,000 square miles across Texas that over here in West Texas is different than East Texas or North Texas and South Texas. Because the last thing you want as a business is to have that cloud of government hanging over you while they're trying to figure out what their policy is. So my main priority and goal is to be the tax collector but to be one that is fair, gets in, does our job, and get out of the way. Because when I mentioned earlier 1.2 million jobs that have been created in Texas, it wasn't the state of Texas that created those jobs. It was men and women with new businesses. One of the examples I gave to a reporter the other day is that changing the tone of customer service about how we interface with the taxpayers and businesses is a priority. And the example I used is the letter that we send a new business. You get the letter in the mail, you open it up, and it says, uh, we're the controller of public accounts. We hear you just created a business. Send us all your information because we're going to tax you. Wow, that sounds real welcoming. <laughs> Change the tone of the letter just a little bit to tell people, you know what, we appreciate that you're putting your personal equity on the line, that you're putting your time, your family's life on the line, that you're part of creating that 1.2 million jobs over the course of the last few years, and we want to tell you thank you. And then politely say, by the way, could you send us our, your information? Sometimes it's the tone upon which you go about things helps create that environment. I'll switch. One of the issues that my predecessor, Susan Combs, and I had worked on together back when I was a member of the state senate several years ago was transparency in government. Susan has made Texas literally a shining example across the nation and around the world in government and transparency. Now, a lot of that program was created back in 2009, which was just a mere six years ago. But tell me, what has changed in technology in the last six years? A lot. So what we need to do is revitalize that program to make sure that we are using the best technology available, that we are communicating in all modes of communication, that people can be able to get the information that they want, making sure that we document what we do, how we do it, but you can also get that snapshot that you want for that information. I plan to update and improve those programs. The new program will include a lot more interactive tools for the public, for our consumers. We will update more often, provide more posts. We'll provide more historical data than has been available before. More financial information will be provided so people have access. More raw data will be put out so they have access to that information, have more charts, graphs, as well as sometimes just a simple thing of a how-to video. The other day I was working at my house and I was working on my pool pump, of all things, and something broke. And I thought, instead of going to the drawer where I could pull it out and all of a sudden when I opened the drawer, a bunch of 
how-to manuals are going to pop out of the drawer. What did I do? I opened my iPad, typed in the quick search name, and there it is. Why do I want that drawer full of manuals that will take me 30 minutes to figure out which one I need when literally just in a couple of seconds I have it right on my fingertips? We need to provide that service for the taxpayers, for businesses, and the public to make sure that you have the information and the data that you need. Now, I will mention one other issue, which is the rainy day fund here in Texas. As some of you are probably, many of you are aware, that our rainy day fund was created when? The 1980s. It was passed in 1987, a constitutional amendment a year later. What happened in the 1980s in Texas? Was an energy what? Crash. People talk about that to me today when they want to say, is Texas going through the 1980s? Yeah, we have a decrease in oil prices, but again, we're not the 1980s. We're a very different Texas than we have been in the past. Transfers to our savings account to the rainy day fund is essentially money that comes off of oil and gas severance taxes. Three quarters of the money goes into the rainy day fund after a certain threshold of dollars from oil and gas severance taxes that were pegged back in 1987 going into the state treasury. Dollars above that limit, three quarters of those, go into the rainy day fund. However, with the exception of last year, when the voters approved a constitutional amendment that we as the legislature, when I was still in the Senate, had passed where we would split half of the money going into the rainy day fund and the controller would certify and send half of that money over into fund six because I mentioned we have a lot of people moving to Texas every single day. That means we have road congestion, and in order to move people, we have to fund transportation projects. So 50% of those dollars go into the, the savings account, and half of those monies go into Fund 6 or for transportation, if it's above $7 billion. Why? Because the select committee of the legislature, the House, and the Senate set a limit that we can make, we are to make those transfers over to the highway fund if we have seven billion dollars in our rainy day fund. How much money will we have in the rainy day fund here at the end of this current fiscal year? Roughly 8.4 billion dollars. By the time the legislature finishes the budget, we roll around fast forward two more years with the next biennium. That number then will grow to be 11.1 billion dollars. That fund is capped at a certain ratio to the state budget and after the next biennium the cap would roughly be about 16.1 billion. Last night during dinner with a few members of the legislature one of them had asked me what is my philosophy when it comes to investing those dollars. Those dollars are not separately invested, they're invested as part of what's called our treasury pool. And the treasury pool, in essence, is obviously a spectrum of assets, as you know, commercial paper, treasuries, agency notes, corporate bonds. And so therefore, the question last night, as I have had several questions over the course of the last several days and the last several weeks from members, is some of my predecessors did not want to invest those dollars outside the treasury pool. Would you be willing to entertain that idea, and I said I would love to have a discussion with you as we go forward through this legislative session. The only thing that I would ask is that you as the legislature, let's make sure that we have a very healthy discussion on what that proper number should be and what those dollars should be invested in. And the reason being is this. The first priority is to make sure that the dollars that we are entrusted with, we make sure that we keep them. And so therefore we have the most conservative strategy right now. And the question is, is should we move that slightly when we have 8.4 billion and roughly 11.1 billion? The legislature needs to have a healthy discussion that what is that cash that we need to have on hand that God forbid we have another significant hurricane or whatever disaster that hits Texas. But if we're going to continue to have large dollars in our rainy day fund, 
then we need to take a much more prudent look at what are the dollars that we need to be investing to make sure the taxpayer ultimately is getting a return on their investment. So with that being said, it's great to see you today. Thank you all for being here in Texas. We're glad that you're here. Continue to shop. <laughs> Continue to buy while you're here. Our sales tax is almost 60% of the revenue that comes into our general related dollars that I mentioned earlier. So I wanna make sure you invest as heavily as you can while you're here because I wanna make sure that our revenue estimate is just on target and you were a portion of that biennial revenue estimate because I knew you were gonna be here today. So thank you all, God bless you, and may you have a safe travel back wherever you're going to here in the next couple of days. So thank you all for letting me be here.